Uh, good afternoon. Today's shear is why Yushalayim is mentioned six, six, seven times in Tanakh, but not even once in the Torah. Madu Avalama, it's for Rafu Yushalayim of Hashima Bat Rivka, and also for Racha Bat Shoshana and Miriam Bat Sima, and Yehuda Chaim and Esther Rafu Yushalayim. And Lahabdom Lechaim Lechaim, Tzidav and Chaim Pesach, and Yitzchak Ben Sara, Dvorah Bas Yitzchak, Abraham and Mordechai David, Reuven Ben Shmuel, Shoshana Bas Lachonon, Yeshua Ben Shmuel, Reuven Ben Shmuel, Chana Golda Bas Yisrael, Chaim Ben Fege, Yaakov Ben Yitzchak, Mordechai Netzach Ben Rivka, Rachel Bas Yosef, Eliezer Ben Yaakov, Chaim Ben Gedalia, Zamal Ben Moshe, Chaim El Yo Ben Yosef Moshe, Ami Chai Ben Yaakov, Ela Nishmatam. Let's take a look at the sheets in front of us. An amazing, uh, she, uh, what I want to talk about here, um, according to Kabbalah, every verse in the Torah corresponds to a calendar year in world history. Again, every verse in the Torah corresponds to a calendar year in human history. So, in the Torah, there's 5,845 verses. So Mashiach has to come before the year 5845, Alfie, because we run out of verses then. We're now in 5777. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we keep eating our spirulina and we do our exercise, we might make it. Mashiach has to come before the year, or the year by 5845, because that's when the Torah runs out of verses. And according to Kabbalah, every verse in the Torah corresponds to a calendar year of Jewish history. So we're getting very close to when Mashiach must come. That's the end game. Where did we get the We round it off. When we say 6,000, we round it off. But it's actually 5845, Masha. How do I know? If you count from Bereshus Aleph Aleph to the last Pasuk in the Torah, you get 5,805 verses, 5845 verses. And each verse corresponds to what? A calendar year of world history, Mashiach has to come by then because we run out of verses. So then he must come by that year. We speak about 6,000, we're speaking in round numbers. Okay? But what's amazing is if you look at Puzzle Gimel in front of you, where it says number three, number three, Puzzle Gimel. You have that, Abraham? Puzzle Gimel. Right? God will bring back your captivity and he will have Rachmanis on you and he himself will return and he will gather you from all the nations God has scattered you so what's amazing is if you count from Bereshus Aleph Aleph Pasuk Gimel happens to be the 5708 Pasuk in the Torah. What's amazing about that? A Jewish state in 48 happens to be the Hebrew year, what? 5708. And 3,329 years ago, amazing, the Torah already in verse 5708, which is Pasuk Gimel, is describing exactly what is going to take place in the year 5708 which is a Jewish state in 48. Read it again, Gimel. God will bring back your captivity. And he will have Rachmanus on you. And he himself will what? Return. And he will gather you from all the nations that he scattered you there. Now, could that be a coincidence that the 5708 verse in the Torah Describing exactly what took place, David, in the year 5708, which is a Jewish state in 48. That's pretty incredible. But it gets even better. So look at, so 5708 verses, Pasuk Gimel. Look down to Pasuk Chet. Pasuk Chet is the year 5710. If Pasuk Gimel is the year 5708, right? Then Pasuk Chet, Hey, Slicha. If Pasuk Gimel is 5708, so took him down, Pasuk Hey. Pasuk Hey, you see that? God will bring you back to the land. 
Asher Yoshua Avatecha, which your forefathers inherited, be rich on you shall possess her, be tifcha, and God will do good to you, be hibachome Avatecha, and he will increase you more than your forefathers. So that's Pasuk Hay, which is the 5710 verse in the Torah, which corresponds to the secular year 1950. What happened in 1950, Dr. Abramson? There was a mass aliyah. Hundreds of thousands of Jews from all over the world flooded Eretz Israel in 1950, from Yemen, from Europe, from all over. And the 5710 Pasuk in the Chumash, which happens to be Pasuk Hay over here, says exactly that. Wow. That's pretty amazing. God will bring you back, Pasuk Hay. It's underlined in yellow. To the land. No, I'm doing. I'm. No, this is fifty. This is fifty-seven ten. If Pasuk Gimel is fifty-seven oh eight, then two took him down is the year fifty-seven ten. The year fifty-seven ten happens to be the secular year nineteen fifty, when Israel absorbed unprecedented numbers of immigrants from all over the world. And that's exactly what's described in Pasuk Hay, which happens to be the 5710 verse in the Torah, which corresponds to the year 5710, which happens to be the secular year 1950. Wow, wow. So it's encoded in the Torah, you don't need any Bible codes, that God will bring us back exactly when it happened. And even though this was written 3,329 years ago, but it's already prophesied in the Torah. But some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. But it's all over here, it's just amazing. It's all over here, amazing. You just have to open up your eyes and look. So this is Devarim 30. Devarim 30, Pasuk Gimel, and Pasuk K, which is 5708. And 5710, a Jewish state in 5708, and Mass Aliyah in 5710, and it's already written in the Torah 3300 and what, and, and 29 years ago. Okay, that's just amazing. Yes? I'm not giving year. Kabbalah says Mashiach has to come when we run out of psukim in the Torah. So he must come by 5845. Because then the calendar as we know it ceases to exist and there'll be a new world order. That's according to Kabbalah. Okay. <coughs> Who says it won't happen? Stay tuned and you'll see. That's the end game. Hopefully it'll happen before that. Okay. So let's move on. We're finished now with our papers. Let's move on. Let's move on now to speak about uh, why Parshish Bamidbar always is the week of what? Of Yom Yerushalayim. Why is that? Parshish Bamidbar speaks about what? Flags. What happens on Yom Yerushalayim? They all march with flags. But of course it's much more than that. We'll get into it soon. It's much more than that. There's a puzzle in Pasha's Ekef, or El Hagodol Agibor Vahanora. And we take that in Shmon Esrei, or El Hagodol Agibor Vahanora. So the Gemara in Yuma 69 says something incredible. Daniel, Daniel came along, Yermia came along, he didn't say Nora. How could you call God Nora awesome when he allowed the Khurban? Bo Daniel, and he didn't say Gibor. Gibor, after Jews were slaughtered in the Khurban, you hear this? And God didn't fire either one. There's a Apostle and Pashas Ekev, Ho'el Hagodol Gibor Vanora. Yuma 69. Yeremia came, he didn't say Nora. Daniel came, he didn't say Gibor. And the Anshak Neset Agdola, they put it back. And in Shmanesha, we do say, So what's going on? Were the Anshak Neset Agdola greater than what? Than Yermio and Daniel? What? They took it out and they put it back. What's going on? <coughs> it's speaking about our time. 
when did they live and when the Antichrist Hagdola lived? We have the unique privilege to live through Khorban. Yermio and Donio, all they saw was Khorban. They just saw Holocaust. So they said, where is God's uh, gvura, heroism? Where is God's awesomeness? They, David, tell it like it is. And God didn't fire them. All they saw was Holocaust. The Antik Neset Hagdola, they lived when the second temple was rebuilt. They saw Holocaust, but they also saw what? Rebirth. So that's God's greatness. But we're able, after the Holocaust, we're able to rejuvenate ourselves. We, this generation, has unique privilege to live through the Korban, the Holocaust, and to live through the rebirth of Israel at the same time. So therefore, we saw the Korban, but we also saw God's greatness that after losing a third of our people, three years later we come back and we build the jewel of the Middle East. So we're like the Antik Neset Agdola. We live to the Korban, but we also see the rebirth and the rejuvenation of, of what? The state of Israel. And we have to appreciate that. And we have to appreciate that. Now, Pashit B'chol Kaltai that we read yesterday is always read right before Yom Rishalayim. So there can't be a coincidence. In Pashit B'chol Kaltai that we read yesterday, the Torah says something amazing. Five IDF soldiers will pursue and capture a hundred of the enemy. Umeo Mikem and a hundred IDF soldiers, Revava Yerdofu, will pursue and capture 10,000 of the enemy. That's what we read yesterday. But the miracle of the Six Day War was greater. It wasn't a hundred capturing 10,000, it was Rav Gorin and his driver capturing 38,000. You can Google it. Rav Gorin and his Jeep driver captured the entire city of Hebron. So it's greater even than what the Pasha told us yesterday. The Pasha said 100 IDF soldiers will capture 10,000 of the enemy. This was two soldiers, Rav Gorin and his driver, capturing the entire city of Hebron. So it's already prophesied where? In the Pasha that is always read the, the week before Yom Mishlein, which is yesterday's reading. It's just a, mir a miracle that everything is in the Torah. We have to open up our eyes and just see. And Pasha B'chosha is always read the week before Yom Rishalayim. Now, so how come the IDF could not liberate the city in 1948? Why did it have to wait till 1967 to liberate the city? There's a Pasuk in Tilim, Shir Amalot, Psalm 122. Shir Amalot to David. Yushalayim habnuya ki ir shechubra yachtav. To rebuild Jerusalem, the city that what unites all Jews together. But in 1948, the Jews were not united. There was Irgun, there was Etzel, there was a Stern Gang, there was Haganah. Only in 1967, when we were united into one IDF, could we what rebellate Yushalayim? Because King David already said. In Psalm Kuf Chav Bet, Yushalayim Habnuya ki ir shechubra yachtav. Only when the Jewish people are united can they liberate Jerusalem. That was not the case in 48. But in 1967, David, if you remember, the unity, the euphoria, and therefore we had to wait until 67, united IDF in order to liberate what? To liberate the holy city of what? Of Jerusalem. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Right? Why we couldn't do it in 48? There was terrible divisions. Haganah, Etzel, Stern Gang, uh, Irgun, all pulling in different directions. It was not Chubra Yachtav, as King David says in Psalm 122. So therefore, we had to wait until what? Until 1967. When we had the When we had united. United and it feels so good, right? That's pretty amazing. Now, Israel is the world leader in high-tech, in low-tech, 
in medical technology. Why is that? We take water from the air. Do you know that, David? Yeah. Why is all of this incredible technology in tiny little Israel? All over the world they come. Even Waze was invented by tiny Israel. You know, if Moshe Rabbeinu would have had Waze in the Midbar Sinai, David, we wouldn't yeah. blunge it for 40 years. Two right? Right? So, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have Waze, so we had to uh, take a detour for 40 years. He got lost, right? But every medical technology, high-tech, low-tech, everything comes from little Israel. Madua Velama. Well, it's a Pasuk and Pasha's Lech Lecha, David. God tells Abraham, call Mishpachai Sadama. In Pasha's Lech Lecha, God tells Abraham, through your children, all the families of the earth will get their blessings. In call Mishpachai Sadama. Through your children, all of the families and nations on earth will get their bracha. So we are living this dream. And therefore, Israel is the leader in all sorts of technology and medicine and military and ways and GPS. Literally fulfilling, Alfie, what God told Abraham 3,800 years ago, that all of the blessings of mankind will become through what? Your children, Avram Avinu. So there's no kawinky dinky that tiny Israel is what? The leader. Now, we're about to observe Yom Yerushalayim, fasting your seat bells. There's an amazing statement in Talmud, Tractate Tainus 29, which is worth pondering as we're about to examine Yom Yerushalayim. The Talmud in Tainus 29 says that both temples were destroyed on a Sunday. Chorben Bayes Rishon by Bavel and Chorben Bayes Sheni by Rome. Titus 29 says both of the destructions took place when? On Sunday. But both times the Levites on duty, you know, every day the Levites sing a different psalm. But both times the Levites on duty got famished. And instead of singing the song of Sunday, they sang the song of Wednesday. What? Never on a Sunday, a Sunday. <laughs> Why did they get mixed up both times? Every single day there's a special psalm the Levites sang. So both Chorim by Trishan and by Shani, which took place on Sunday, the Talmud in, in Titus 29 says, both times the Levites made a mistake and they sang the psalm of Wednesday. Oh. Alfie, fasten your seatbelts. What's the psalm of Wednesday? Psalm 94. Kel nekamos Hashem. Kel nekamos hofia. Don't worry, I will not give up my day job. God of the come up here. Kel nekamos Hashem. God, bring revenge on our peace partners. That's the psalm of Wednesday. Even though the Churban was on Sunday. The Levites seen the Churban. They issued the last minute plea to a Kurdish Baruch Hu for what? For Nekama. So they chose the Shear of Wednesday. Shear Shayoim Psalm 94, God of revenge appear. God of vengeance. What's so special about Wednesday for us? Fast forward, David, over 1900 years to the Six Day War. When the IDF took control of the Temple Mount, when the famous general Mati Gore said, Hara Bayis Biyudenu, what day of the week was it? Wednesday. Wednesday. Connie, is that a coinky dinky? I don't think so. 1900 years later, the Levites sang the Psalm of Wednesday, the Khurban. And when did the IDF liberate Harabayit? It could only be what? Wow. Wednesday. I don't think, Masha Shelley, that can be a coinky dinky. I don't think so. That day in June, 67, happened to have been a Wednesday. Alfie, you can Google it. How did Levites know 2,000 years before that? Hmm. How did they know that? Now, 
We said before that the name Yerushalayim, we'll discuss what the name means, is written 667 times in the Bible, not once in the Torah, we'll talk why. But what's amazing about 667, when did the IDF liberate Yerushalayim? It happened to have been, June is the sixth month, and the year 67. Now even though it's secular, but we go according to the secular calendar. So it cannot be a coincidence that the IDF liberated the city in the secular month 6, which is June, and the secular year 67, which is 667, and that's exactly how many times Yushalayim is mentioned where? In Tanakh. Now, could that be a coincidence? Wow. David, come on. So people say it's secular. So what? There's no coincidence. We follow a secular calendar. <clears throat> the Torah lives in the real world. The Torah doesn't live in ivy towers. The Torah lives in the real world. So 667, that's just amazing. And that's how many times uh, Yushalayim is mentioned in Tanakh. How many Jews were they here in 1948? 600,000. How many Jews left Egypt? Koinki dinky Alfie? I don't think so. When we came back in 48, there were 600,000 Jews. And when we left Egypt, there was also 600,000 Jews. Wow. Gee, I don't think that's a coincidence. Hmm. A Jewish state in 48. A Jewish state in 48. That's just amazing. Now, there's a shul in the Rova called the Churva Shul. Anybody know that shul? Yeah. The Churva Shul. Why is it called the Churva? The Vilna Gaon says, there's a Gemara in Brachot that speaks that this Tana went to Davin in the Churva. The Churva. The Gemara in Brachot says that. According to Vilna Gaon, that's the destroyed shul in the old city. The Gemara in Brachot says this Tana went to play pray in the Churva. So the Vilna Gaon says that that's the destroyed shul in the old city. Who went to pray there, Rabbi? Atana, one of the sages of the Mishnah. Now the Vilna Gaon says something incredible. He says, when that Churva in the old city is rebuilt, that's a sign that the third temple is going to be rebuilt very shortly. The Vilna Gaon in 1790 like now, you remember the Churva Shul was rebuilt. Yeah. You don't remember? Bibi awesome. went to the beautiful dome, and Abu Mamza went nuts. Yeah. You remember Abu Mamza went nuts? Yeah. Why did he get so excited, Sonia? It, it, it built a shul in the Rova Yehudi. Yeah. It's always ours. Why did he have a fit? Why did Abu Mamza have a fit? And he went nuts. Because he knows what the Vilna Gaon knows. That if the Chur Bashul is rebuilt in the heart of the Rova, the Vilna Gaon said in 1790, that's a siman that the third temple is going to be rebuilt very soon. And therefore the Arabs went nuts. Why should they care? We didn't build in Shuafat. We built in the heart of the Rova. Do you remember how they went with sugar? Censoring us, UN special meeting. They know. Halavai, we would know what the Vilna Gaon already said in 1790. That's just amazing. That's just amazing. It is. Now, we said, now if you don't fasten your seatbelts for this, you're going to fall off your chair. We know that Pasha's Bamidbar is always the week of Yom Mushalayim. What Pasha will begin to read today, David? Pasha's Bamidbar. And this week is Yom Mushalayim. Now, what in the world, Sharona, does Pashis by Midbor have to do with Yom Mishalayim? That Yom Mishalayim always falls in the week of what? Of Ba Midbar. I don't seem to see any connection. But there's an amazing Zohar. Should have copied it for you. But I'll read it to you. The Zohar on Pashis by Midbar. Now, people think the Zohar is a mystical book. It's true. But the main purpose of the Zohar is to be a perush on Tanakh. Did you know that? People think it's only mysticism. It's true, but it's also a perush. How do you say that in English? A, a commentary of the, of the Tanakh. Yeah. And in Pashis Bamidbar, 
The Zohar writes 2,000 years ago. Please hear me well. Rabbi Elazar Latame, the son of the Rajbi, there's a pasuk in Yeshayo, Simchot Yushalayim. They sing it, Simchot Yushalayim, da da da. da. Right? There's a pasuk in Yeshayo, Simchot Yushalayim. In Pasis Ba Midbar, Rivka, from left field, the Rajbi's son quotes a pasuk, Simchot Yushalayim. Gee, what has it got to do with Pasis Ba Midbar? Rajbi from 2,000 years ago. Hello. Rejoice, Jerusalem. Why does the Rajbi's son 2,000 years ago in the Zohar quote that pasuk in which parsha? Bamidbar, G, which always falls what? Jerusalem. Koinky dinky? No. So the Rajbi's son says, he quotes Simchot Yushalayim in Pasha Bamidbar. And then he seems to a contradiction. In Tilim 100, it says, Ibdut Hashem Bishimcha. You should serve God with joy. In Tilim 2, it says, Ibdot Hashem Don't serve God with joy, serve God with fear and trepidation. Uh -huh. So, King David, make up your mind. Both ways. Uh -huh. Either or. Right. Psalm 100, Ibdot Hashem Simcha, serve God with joy to the world. And Psalm 2, no, forget about it, serve God through fear. Says that Rabbi Lazar, the son of the Rajbi, in Pashas, Bamidbar, where he quotes Simchot Yushalayim from left field. Parsha of Midbar. It says as follows. Ibdus Hashem Simcha, Psalm 100. That's only when, when the Jewish people are in Eretz Hakdosha. When the Jewish people live in Pisgat Zev. I mean, where in, where do you live? Arnona? Arnona. Arnona. When Jewish people live in Arnona, Baka. Rabbi Lozo Tamei, 2,000 years ago. Ibdos Hashem B'Simcha. That's only Be'er, the Zman, Shi Yisrael, Shochnim, when the Jewish people live in the Holy Land. Oz Iker Avodah B'Simcha. Then you can serve God with joy. But when King David says, Ibdos Hashem B'Yira, Kan B'Yisrael, Shochnim, Be'eretz, Acheret, Be'Golut. When the Jews are living in Teaneck, New Jersey. Oz Iker Avoda Rak Mitoch Yira. You this, Sonia? You getting this? How do they learn this in Borough Park? They learned the, they learned the Zohar in Borough Park. I'm sure they learned the Zohar in Borough Park. Maybe you should fax it to them. Sefer Zohar Pashis by Midbar Daf Kuf Yud Page 118, side A. So, when King David said, Ibn Hashem b'simcha, that's only when the Jewish people are living in the Holy Land. Only then can you experience joy to the world. Ibn wow. Hashem b'yira, that's when the Jewish people are living be'eretz acheret, be'galut, then the avod of God can only be what? Fear. That's why in Borough Park they're always trembling. They're afraid to drink the water, too many germs. What do they say? There's, there's creepy crawlers in the water. Hmm? Just amazing. Uh, you can look it up. The Zohar, Parshish by Midbar, Daf Kuf Yud Ches, page 118, side A. Incredible. What? Are you with me on this? Yes. Pretty amazing. <coughs> yes. What does Bamidbar got to do with Simchot Yerushalayim? So when the Rashbi wrote that, we didn't know what he's talking about. No, but what, what, what part of Parshish Bamidbar caused him to give that commentary? Uh, that's my question. Look it up, page 118 in the Zohar, Parshish Bamidbar. From left field, from left field, the Re Rabbi Lazar, the son of Rashbi, quotes Simchot Yerushalayim. What it got to do with anything in Parshish Bamidbar? But 2,000 years later, we see, because Pasha's my midbar Lillian is always the week of what? Yom Rishalayim. So 2,000 years ago, the Rashbi and the son wrote, Rejoice Jerusalem, joy is only where? In, in Eretz Israel. otherwise they're serving God from what? Fear. When they wrote it, we didn't know. But now we know, and only 2,000 years ago, 
when they wrote it, we, what are you talking about, guys? Take a pill and lie down. What are you talking about? But we know. Wow. Simcha's only Simcha's only when the Jewish people are where? In the Holy Land. If the Shem is Simcha. When the Jewish people are not living in the Holy Land, then they can only serve God from fear. So King David does not contradict himself. But when they wrote this, nobody knew what they're talking about. What's got to do with Pashtun Midbar? We know. Rachmiel, because Pashtun Midbar is always what? Jerusalem, yes. Kwinky Dinky? No. 2,000 years ago. That's just amazing. It gets even better. I hope you're getting this down. Now, the signs of the final Gula. If you look in Zechariah 14, he speaks about the final Gula, and he says, when UNESCO and the EU and the UN are attacking us on Jerusalem. Zechariah 14 tells us, David, that the signs of the final gulag, Zechariah lived 2,400 years ago. Not that long ago, right? He says in, in 14, the sign of the final gulag, when the entire world gangs up and attacks us on Jerusalem. UNESCO, UN, EU. But then he makes a very strange statement. The Gam Yehuda Tilachim Birushalayim. Also, the Jews will make war against Jerusalem. Look at Zechariah 14, Dr. Abramson. Now I understand, he said, the entire world will gang up and attack us and say you have no right in Jerusalem. That's the script. But then Zechariah says something very bizarre. The Gam Yehuda Tilachim Birushalayim. The Jews will also go to war and say we have no claim to Jerusalem. Zechariah, what are you talking about, David? But we know, breaking the silence, Jews for Palestine, J Street and Meretz, they join the enemy and say that we have no right to Jerusalem. Look at the ad in the Arex, Friday's the Arex. Gush Shalom, a big ad. Jerusalem is occupied. Yeah. They're living, the, what, Gam Yehuda, the Jewish people who also attack us and say that we have no right to Jerusalem. Yeah. We're occupying our own city. Hello, when Zechariah said this, they told him, take a pill and lie down. What do you mean the Jews will attack you in Jerusalem? Yeah. It's incredible. 2,400 years ago, we see it. Yeah. Palace, Jews for Palestine, J yeah. Street, Meretz. Look at Friday's Haaretz. You'll get nauseous. A big ad from Peace Now. We're occupying Jerusalem. Yeah, they live right here. That's Zechariah 14. Vigam Yehuda. Telechem Bishalayim. Rabbi Avraham. Echu Yoda. Lifnei Alpayim Arba Meyad Shona. What? The Aretz will put an ad in on Friday. Navi. Ah, Navi. What's 2400 years? Yes. Yeah. I like to see what the enemy is saying. That's it. Actually, I don't buy it. Someone gives it to me. I, instead of wrapping dead fish, he gives it to me. You what, they, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's one lefty there. Wow. So he gives it to me when he's finished, after he slobbered over it. But I couldn't believe that Ed. In Irish? I thought of Zechariah 14. The Navi is speaking for today. Yeah. When he said it, nobody knew what the heck he's talking about. The Jews will attack us on Jerusalem. It's just amazing. Rabbi, you No, I'm fine. Where was I? Don't confuse me. Now, Pasha's Yisro is Pasha Matan Torah. Right? Now, right before God give us the Ten Commandments, he says, kohanim. You will be for me a kingdom of priests. Mamlechet melucha. What does melucha mean in modern English? Sovereignty. So the Torah already said in Pastor's Yisro, a precondition for Matan Torah is to establish a Jewish sovereign state. So says the great Nachmanides. It's a mitzvah not to wait for Mashiach. It's a mitzvah. I'll use a little water. Thank you. Glad you asked. Thank you. Hits the spot, thank you. 
Right before God speaks the Ten Commandments, he says, you shall be for me mamlechet kohanim, says Nachmanides. There's a mitzvah to establish a Jewish melucha. How do you say that in English? Kingdom. A kingdom. What's a kingdom? A sovereign state. Not to wait for Mashiach. And that's spoken right before Matan Torah. So what the Ramban is telling us, a precondition for Matan Torah is to establish a Jewish melucha. A sovereign state. And I think he was Haredi, Nachmanides. I think he was Haredi. Gets even better. Dev and Ezra, who lived before the Ramban, who also Haredi, he says something incredible. Pashas Baaloscha. He says, Sheshaftam Eretz Oyev, when you come back from your land of your enemies. This is Evan Ezra writing in Pashas Baaloscha. When you come back, Eretz Oyev, when you come back from your land of your enemies, Ukvatem Yom Simcha, Kimei Purim. Then you have to establish a yontiv like Purim. Mikan says Evan Ezra in Pashas Baaloscha. But every time we come back from the land of our enemies and come back to the Holy Land, there is a mitzvah to establish a yontif. So says the Eben Ezra in Pastors Baaloischa, on the Pastor Kubiyom Simchatchem Mimelechem, in the day of your joy and festivals. What's the day of your joy? Says Eben Ezra, when you come back from the land of your enemies and establish sovereignty in your homeland, that's a time biyom simchatchem, in Bamidbor passes by Eloischa. It's a mitzvah in a Torah to celebrate Yom Yishalayim. Who said that? The Eben Ezra a thousand years ago, and he was Haredi. But some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. Passes by Eloischa, biyom simchatchem, in the day of your joy, says Avram Eben Ezra a thousand years ago, when you come back from the land of the enemies, back home and you establish Jewish sovereignty, there is a Torah mitzvah to rejoice. What's he telling me, Rachmiel? That on Wednesday, there's a mitzvah to what? Joy to the world. He was very Haredi, Evan Ezra. He lived about Rashi's time. Before the Ramban quotes him extensively. The Ramban lived in the 1200s, quotes the Evan Ezra extensively. So just amazing. Now, from Holocaust to homecoming, three years. Three years of Yaakov after the Holocaust we came home. From victims to being victors in three years? My head is spinning. From Holocaust to homecoming, three years. From victims to victors. The nest of Israel, Churban and rebirth. Rejuvenation. Reju. No nation comes back after 2,000 years. It just doesn't happen. No nation can reju rejuvenate after 2,000 years. It's amazing. From Hester Ponim, the worst Hester Ponim was Auschwitz. Hester Ponim, I said in English, where God hid his face in Auschwitz to the most open revealed miracles. Yom Rishalayim. Asian miracles that took place here. Where the, the Arab armies took off their boots and they ran. They ran. What, what, are you, what are you running from? A little tiny Israel. Right? Surrounded by 22 Arab armies with tanks and planes. What are you running from? From Hester upon him to open and reveal Shechina. That's just amazing. That's just amazing. Now, we know Abraham Vino was born in the year 1948 from creation. Say that Dora tells you that. And the Jewish state was born in 48. Now, it's secular, but the UN gave us a right in 1948. So I don't think it's a coincidence that Abraham Vino, the first Jew, was born in 1948 from Briat Olam. And the UN voted in 48. It's a minion Hagoyim, but it's still, it's the UN. Why 1948? He's saying 47. Yeah, but when did the state establish? Thank you. But when was the state established? 48. Not 47, 48. Madua. 
Because Avraham Avinu was born, not in 1947, he was born in 1948. That's right. Ah, why 1948? Fasting is, right? That's when the UN gave us permission to partition. 48, May 1948, right? right. Why? Ain't me English left. Okay, but why 48? I'll tell you why. In Parshas Lech Lecha, God tells Avram, was born in what year? 1948. He says, Ani Hashem, I am God, I took you out from the fiery crematoria of Kazdim. Remember, Abraham was thrown into crematoria, remember? Avram was thrown into the fiery furnace. So God tells him, I am God who took you out me Ur Kazdim from the fiery furnace of Kazdim, in order to what? Give you this land. Thank you, my whistle is dry. It's just amazing. If God was speaking to Abraham, it wouldn't be in the Torah. Torah is GPS, David, not Sipurim. The Torah is GPS. God's personal system. So God is telling us, thank you, through Abraham, I took you out from the fiery crematoria, to give you what? 3,800 years ago, Pasha's Lech Lecha. Therefore, a Jewish state in 48, Avram was born in 48. We also came from the Ur, the fiery furnace of Auschwitz. We also came. Now Israel is called Eretz Zavas Cholavet Vash. Israel is called the land flowing with milk and honey. Remember the Elal commercials, Alfie? Mm -hmm. The first message at the burning bush. Moses was a rookie. The first message before Kabbalah Satora. Right. What did God say, Rivka? I'm going to bring up my people from Cairo to give them Eretz. Zavas Cholvedvash. First message to the rookie Moses, you can look it up. Why milk and honey? What about Jaffa oranges? What about the Arctic here? It's good Arctic. What's so special that God told Moses? A land flowing with milk and honey. Fasten your seat belts for this. Scientists did a study that the date palm trees in Israel give more date honey than any date palm on the face of the earth. Should I repeat that? Wow. When it speaks about Dvash, what kind of Dvash it speaks about? Date, date. Dvash Temarim, date honey. Yeah. Scientists did a study that the date palm trees in Israel give more date honey per tree than any date palm in any other nation. Mm -hmm. So therefore God said a land flowing with the vash. Uh, Chalav. Ooh, don't steal my thunder. Scientists did a study that, remember Elsie the cow? Yeah. If Elsie the cow in Eretz Yisrael, the cows in Eretz Yisrael give more milk per cow than any cow on the face of the earth. I don't know, but you can Google it. You can Google it, Matt, you can Google it. So therefore, 3,329 years ago, the first message to Holy Moses was what? How did God know that the date honey in Israel is more per date honey than any tree? And how did God know that the milk cows in Israel give more milk than any other cow on the planet? Gee, how did God know that? And therefore, he keeps saying, Eretz, Zavas, Chol, and Mash. You know the difference between a, a Jewish cow and a non-Jewish cow? What? A non-Jewish cow goes moo. A Jewish cow goes no. You don't believe me? Go to Kibbutz Chofetz Chaim. The Jewish cows, they go not moo, no. Amazing. Over and over again, the Torah says, a land flowing with milk and honey. How did God know that? Gee, hmm. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Now, 
The Pasha we read yesterday tells us that what? That I will make the land desolate. One of the terrible curses, I will make the land desolate. Yesterday's reading. Rashi says, Midatovel Yisrael. It looks like a curse, but it's actually, how do you say Midatova? A good tiding. Because for 2,000 years, when we went to Galut, our enemies would find no Nachat Ruach here. How do you say that in English, Alfie? No Nachat Ruach. Because Israel will be Shomema, desolate. Mark Twain was here in the 1800s. He said he never saw such a, I want to say God forsaken, <laughs> barren desert yeah. as Pisgat Zeb was. Pisgat Zeb, before 1967, where I lived, where the peace partners had it, looked like a barren moonscape. And after 1967, Pisgat Zeb is Gan Eden. Yeah. So Rashi already tells us, Israel went into hibernation. Became barren, so our enemies would not be able to enjoy her. But in 1948 and 1967, we made the desert bloom. You see pictures of Pisgat Zev, Rabbi Yaakov, before and after. Moonscape, Garden of Eden. What happened? When Jordanians were able to 67 in Pisgat Zev, it was a barren, desolate. The Torah says so. And when we came back in 67, the land opened up for us. It's incredible. It's all here. You just have to know, Alfie, where to look. After 1900 years, the land of Israel opened up only for her children. The peace partners, they had barren stone and sand until 1967. What, they're not as smart as us? Jordanian farmers are not as smart as us, Masha? They couldn't figure it out. No. They're not dumb. But this is the promise that Rashi told us in yesterday's reading. That our enemies will not find any pleasure here because the land for them will be desolate. Will only begin to bloom and blossom when her children come back. That's us. And the Gemara in Sanhedrin 98 says, there's no greater sign of the final gula than the abundant blooming of produce in Eretz Israel. Sanhedrin page 98. That's a sign of the gula. The abundant blooming of produce in Eretz Israel. And that's actually happening now. Yeah. Now, the eating the produce of Eretz Israel, it's amazing that the Bach, one of the great decisors of Shulchan Aruch, who lived in the 1600s, the Bach in the tour, or Echayim 208. How do I say 208 in Hebrew? Simon Reish Chet writes that the Shechina enters our soul through the produce of Eretz Yisrael. He wrote this in Poland, wow. 1600. The Shechina enters the Jewish soul through eating the produce of Pisgat Zev. The Bach wrote this over 400 years ago. That the produce of Eretz Yisrael has the Kiddushah of the Shekhinah. Eating what? Yeah. The fruits and vegetables of Eretz Yisrael. But they're none so blind who will not see. Jews who remain the Shmutz Laretz, they forfeit the schus of being part of the greatest miracle in our history in 2,000 years. How could you just let it pass you by? Wow. Wow, wow. Now, it's amazing that the whole world comes here to see and learn in all fields. We're a leader in drip irrigation. We sell water to Jordan, to Africa, little Israel. We come here. The whole world comes here to what? Learn from us. Little Israel. They're not smart like us. From Zion will come out the Torah just doesn't mean studying Torah. It means all, all 
knowledge that can help mankind comes from Zion, Isaiah chapter 2. So they all come here to learn knowledge, how to help the world. We are the world. That's also part of Torah. To help the world with all their problems. So they all come here. Wow. So we're the leader in medicine, military, robot operation. You get a little robot that'll do your cleaning for you, David. Invented in Israel. I'm not joking. R2 D2. All invented here. But we're the leader. We're the leader. They all come here to learn. Kimitzion Teche Torah. Torah means any knowledge that can help mankind better themselves. Okay. Now we have to get to Yushalayim. Yushalayim is 667 times mentioned in Tanakh, but it's not mentioned once in the Torah. Madu'a Valama. So we said Yushalayim is a combination of two words. Yeroe Shalem. Avram called the place Har Hashem Yeroe, Yakeda, the mountain where God will be seen. When we come up to the base of Migdash, we see God, Kaviochel. And Malki Tzedek already called the uh, place Shalem. So God took Yeroe Shalem and he combined it. it says Tosfot and Tainit. These two great people, Yera Shalem, the mountain where God is seen, and Malki Tzedek already called the place what? Shalem. So Jerusalem is a tale of two cities. Tale of two cities, named by two great people, Abraham and Malki Tzedek. Who's Malki Tzedek? Shem ben Noach. It's a combination of two names, Yera Shalem. Let's consider the implication of the dual names. Yera relates to the Yakeid of Yitzchak which is unique to the Jewish people. Shalem was given by Malki Tzedek ben Noach, relates to all B'nai Noach. So Jerusalem will be an international city. Yerah Shalem. God tells Isaiah, Ki beiti beiti filah, yikor el amim. My house is a house of prayer, I call all nations. That's the name Yerah Shalem. Yireh, Yeroeh, Abraham said the place where God is seen, the Malki Tzedek Shalem. Who named it first? Malki Tzedek. So it should be called Shalem Yireh. Malki Tzedek called it Shalem. Abraham called it Yireh later. So how can we say Yireh Shalem, not Shalem Yireh? Because even though Jerusalem and the temples for all people, but who's number one? Yireh. Avraham, the Akeda, that comes first. Yireh Shalem. Avraham named it later, but the Jewish people of Amon Ifchar, the Goyim will have to acknowledge that. It's also for them, the temple's for them, but they have to acknowledge that we are what? B'ni B'chari B'Yisrael. We are God's firstborn. So therefore, even though Shem ben Noach named it Shalem first, God doesn't call it Shalem Yireh. God calls it what? Yireh Shalem. Because Avraham Avinu and the Akeda is unique for us, Yitzchak. So that has Kadima, even though all people are welcome, as Isaiah says. Isaiah says that. Now, Jerusalem is Israel's DC. DC, before Washington, DC. If you look at Samuel 2, chapter 5, Jerusalem was Israel's DC. 3,000 years before Washington, D.C. What's D.C.? David's capital. Get it? Yeah. David's capital. 3,000 years before what? Washington. But now we have to understand why it's not written in Tanakh, in the Chumash. Yeah. It's not written in the Chumash. I'll tell you why. If you look in the last verse in Yechezkel, Yechezkel speaks about the Bayesh Lishi and Mashiach. The very last pasuk in Yechezkel. He says, the shame or ear, Miom, the name of the city from the day Mashiach will come, Hashem Shama. Hashem Shama, God is over there. 
The city will change. The name, you'll have to throw out your envelopes with the Arnon on it. Because Ezekiel tells us in the last Pesach in Ezekiel that Jerusalem's name will change. It won't be called Yerushalayim anymore. It's going to be called Hashem Shama. God is over there. And Baba Basra says another reading, Hashem Shama. God is the name. What does that mean? Yerushalayim, it's written Yerushalayim. And we pronounce it Yerushalayim. Because the Patach Mem in Hebrew, Yud Mem makes it plural. Ozen, Oznayim, Yad, Yadayim, Rega, Raglayim. So why do we pronounce it Yerushalayim, but it's Shalem has no Yud? The Yud Mem in Hebrew, the ending makes it plural. So the Talmud tells us there's an earthly Jerusalem, but there's also a heavenly Jerusalem. So therefore, its name is implied in the city. We pronounce it Yushalayim, plural, heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. And they're parallel underneath each other. Like the Nisham and the Guf. Like the soul and the body, the heavenly and the earthly. When Mashiach comes, we're going to have Kiyat HaMesim. Where the soul and the body will merge forever. That's reflected in the new reality of the city. Yushalayim Shalmala will, what's the word? Merge Yushalayim Shalmata. Reunited and it feels so good. And that will be reflected in the new name, Hashem Shama. God is there. Or another reading, Hashem Shema. God is her name. The name of Jerusalem will reflect the new reality. In the Messianic era, where the heavenly and the earthly will what? Merge. That's Tchiat HaMeitim. And that's reflected in the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem come together right now. So the name will change to reflect the new reality. Hashem Shema. God is her name. Or Hashem Shema. God is over there. Heaven and earth will merge. That's symbolized by the new name, and that's the idea of Tchiat HaMetim. When Mashiach comes, the Animamin, that the dead will what, David? Rise up. Rise up. The Sham and the Gulf will what? Merge. And that's reflected in the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem reuniting. That's a symbol of Tchiat HaMetim. And that will be reflected in the new name. Hashem Shema, Hashem Shema. God is her name, or God is over there. And therefore, the name is not written in the Chumash, because the name is destined to change. The last puzzle in Yechezkel to reflect the new reality, the new world order, where heaven and earth will what? Come together and merge. That's the symbol of the Harabayit. So you shall I am. The plural, the heavenly and the earthly. And we have to know that we are directly parallel on the what? Shlaim Shalmala. This is the center of the universe. The nations of the world know that. Why are they so crazy for little Jerusalem? They know it, that this is the center of the universe. They know that the earthly city is directly parallel to the heavenly city. Halavai, halavai we should know it. Thank you very much. Thursday, we have a class in the current events in the Haftorah this Thursday. Toda Rabbah.